Hello and welcome to another video from the only channel that you need to not only survive the current apocalypse but actually enjoy it. And today's video is going to be about how I take care of my woods. Uh, a couple of reasons I'm doing this. First one is I'm in the process. It's time of year. Every year I'm supposed to come through here and thin this out a little bit so that everybody gets to be healthy. That, you know, too many trees in a tight spot and you end up with sick trees. But another thing is, I had a subscriber that wrote me and asked me what I thought might be man's responsibility for taking care of the earth according to the Bible. Well, I already did that video and I posted it a little while ago. I think I answered that question very well. Uh, primarily, we talked about uh, God putting mankind into the Garden of Eden in order to dress and keep the garden. And that's our English translation. In the original Hebrew, what it actually says is to serve and protect, and the way it's translated, it makes me think that man was put in the garden to serve and protect it in order that the garden might serve and protect him. Well, the Garden of Eden is gone, and these gar this, this woods right here ain't going to take care of me. I still got to go to Walmart to get most of my groceries. But I still think that last 30 or so years that I've been taking care of the woods have given me a little bit of insight that a lot of people don't have. And so we're going to go ahead and, and do a little bit of a walk around and I'm going to talk about some of the decisions I made this time around as far as my uh, thinning and pruning program goes. Here we have a pile of trees that I cut down this year in the thinning process and actually have three piles like this. Two are here on this property and one is at a friend's house. He came and picked up a pickup truck load to use for bean poles. It's important to keep in mind that the purpose of all the hard work we're doing out here is to create a paradise of pleasure. So it's not just important that we thin out our forest so that the trees can be happy. We want to thin it out in such a way as to make ourselves happy. Our eventual goal should be to make a forest which we can walk through barefoot. That's not going to happen immediately, but eventually that will be the case. But if you're standing up to use your loppers, you're not going to be able to do that. You're going to be creating sharp edges that can seriously hurt. In fact, if you're walking across a forest floor with something like this sticking out of the ground and you fall down, you could seriously injure yourself. A much better way to get things as comfortable as possible is to simply sit on the ground and cut off our stumps as close to the ground as possible. You won't be able to walk across that it'll barefoot because it'll still hurt your foot, but eventually that'll rot away and that won't be the case. This also applies to other cutting instruments such as this chainsaw. If you decide to use a chainsaw, you cannot treat your chainsaw like a pair of loppers. You can actually cut trees off below ground level with a pair of loppers, and although that will dull the blades, that's easily fixed with a file, a hammer, and a piece of sandpaper. But if you get the cutting edge of your chainsaw into the dirt, dirt will get between the chain and the bar and destroy the bearing surface, something that cannot be fixed in any way but will require an expensive replacement. From this video, it may appear as if I just broke that rule. However, there's about two inches of leaf litter on the ground here in my woods, and although leaf litter will cause some wear and tear, it's more similar to the wear and tear brought about by cutting the trees and not anywhere near as harmful as the wear and tear that would be brought about by running the saw directly into the dirt. Now, if you notice, I was cutting <clears throat> With the top of the saw, you don't really have to. You can cut with the bottom or the top. The only reason I cut with the top is because I'm so low to the ground that I want the shavings to be thrown that way. When you're cutting from the bottom, 
the shavings are thrown this way along with leaves and stuff and that'll start to accumulate inside this uh, gap in your saw. Just a bit of helpful information if you're thinking about doing something like this is that where I'm at is deep in the woods. I'm not next to a main road. In fact, for me to get this debris to where the garbage is picked up would be impossible. It's about a thousand feet that way to the main road and that's through a bunch of swamp with a bunch of trees. It's over a couple of walking bridges, through a couple of gates. There's really no way to dispose of this stuff that way, but that's okay because that's really a poor way of handling it anyway. If you've got a wooded area, it's best to simply find an area that's not too close to any trees you're concerned about and burn it. But in order for that to work, you're gonna have to have a really hot fire because the stuff you're burning is green. So what I do, I make a really tight fire first, fire pile, and then after it's had about two weeks to dry up, I'll light it. And you'll be able to light this thing with a match. Then you can put your green stuff on there and burn it any way you like. I'm gonna show you what you have to do to get this pile this tight. You're not gonna be able to make a pile out of this kind of stuff because the air spaces between the branches are not, gonna, not going to allow the parts you get to light to light the other parts. In other words, if, if this limb is on fire, that's not gonna have anything to do with this limb. It's not gonna jump over. So we're gonna cut everything is into small parts and show you just how compact you can actually get this with a little bit of time. But as little as this amount of time is, uh, if you have to do this to everything that you burn, you're never gonna get anything done. You absolutely have to have a, a really hot fire that'll burn green stuff or you'll never get this done. If you notice, as I'm cutting, it's all getting really close to the ground. And when this is done, all I have to do is pick this up and add it to the pile. I mean, it's, I could just tell you to do this, but I think when you see it, it makes a bigger impression. And this may seem like a simple lesson to people that have already done this before. But I, I burned quite a bit of stuff out here before I figured out that this was important. Now, that great big fluffy pile of stuff is really tight. So as this dries, if you light it, it'll all burn. It's really important that you don't let your fire get out of control, but a, a lot of that is simply not making a fire pile that is too big or too hot because anytime you burn something in the forest, it's always going to cause some kind of injury. So uh, how much injury you're willing to cause is subjective. That's up to you. But once you get your fire pile to the size that you think you can handle and that the trees around you can handle, don't put anything else on it. From this point on, you're gonna have to simply wait until the pile gets dry enough to light. It doesn't mean you can't continue working, but as you're working, it's best to simply cut the trees that you want to thin or prune and leave them laying where they drop. It doesn't, uh, there's no point in dragging these into a pile and certainly no point in dragging them up close to your fire. You want the area around your fire to be clear so you can work it. You don't wanna be putting a lot of stuff in your way. If you're going to be burning debris out in the woods, you need to have some buckets of water handy to keep the fire under control. Now, we're not talking about a one-day project. Uh, if you're doing what I'm doing, you'll be out here every day, week after week, month after month. You're not going to want to be carrying water back and forth every day. You're going to want to bring your water out and leave it there. Problem with that is uh, small animals, insects, will get in the water and drown, and they won't drown instantly. They'll suffer for a long time. So what I figured out is that if you just put a couple of floating sticks in there, then whatever gets into this water can climb up onto those sticks. And if it's flying insect, it's only going to take them a minute or two to dry out, and then they'll fly out. And the same thing with things like lizards and frogs and spiders. If they climb on these sticks during the course of the day, at some point the sticks will come into contact with the edge, and if the bucket's full enough, they'll be able to climb out. So that's another rule I have is I always try to keep my buckets pretty full 
so that nothing has to stay in there too long. Paradise just wouldn't be paradise without rest. But if you allow sunlight to hit the ground, what's going to happen is all of the energy in that sunlight is going to be converted right back into trees and shrubs by the trees and shrubs that you just cut down. Now looking at this, it seems like I've completely stripped away the canopy because there is so much sunlight hitting the ground. But that's only a temporary situation. Now this time of year, it's not that big of a deal that we have a lot of sunlight hitting the ground. It's winter, which means that nothing's really growing very fast. And in fact, a lot of things are not growing at all. Now where I am standing at the beginning of the year was a very densely packed stand of small trees. I went through and picked out the ones I thought were the best. I cut everything else down. But as a result of that uh, tightness, not very much light was getting down to this part of the tree. In fact, uh, if you look up, there's only a little bit of green at the very tops. And I find that most trees have that tendency that if they start to experience a lot of shade in one area, those areas of the tree die. The tree itself doesn't die, but the limbs and leaves die. And as you can see, it doesn't take anything to knock this stuff off. These are just dead limbs. And for the most part, uh, everywhere you knock them off, if sunlight hits that area, new limbs and leaves will come out. So the sunlight that is hitting the ground directly is not going to be an issue about the middle of summer. After the initial job of thinning our forest, there is still follow-up work that needs to be done. Even though we're going to do everything in our power to cut our stumps as low as we can, uh, the effect is going to be that we have a lot more area to walk over. Initially, you'll be cutting in areas that have never been stepped on by human feet. These areas are going to be very, very loosely packed because it's just a human tendency. If you're walking between two trees that are 10 feet apart, you're going to walk directly between the two, leaving five feet on either side. But once that tree's cut down, you're not going to think about that. You're just going to walk wherever you want, which means that that loosely packed soil is going to become compressed. And you're going to end up with a lot of stumps that you cut right down to the ground that are actually about two inches tall. This may not be an issue for you, but it is for me. There's no way to keep track of all of them, but if every now and then I'll just walk through the woods with my chainsaw or my loppers, and if I step on one of those things, I'll cut it. You're not going to get them all, but over the course of time, you'll get most of them. Now, another thing to keep in mind is that every one of these stumps is going to try to go back to being a tree, and they're going to put out a lot of little limbs that you can just run over with your lawnmower if you run over them within a few months after, them, uh, after they're coming out of the ground. If you put off too long, you're going to end up with a bunch of little trees that are too big to cut with your mower. And once again, you're going to have to sit down on the ground with your loppers and cut each one of those down individually. Another really handy item to have is vinyl marking tape. And you can get in a lot of different colors. I, I particularly like colors that don't blend in. Orange is a good one. Blue is a good one. But uh, this is the kind of tape used by surveyors when they're marking the edge of a property. You can also use it to mark trees that you won't, don't want to cut down because a lot of times uh, when you're cutting hundreds or even thousands of trees in a thinning process, you'll get kind of lost as to where you are and you can cut down trees that you don't want to cut down. I've done that before. I've cut down trees that I've planted. So don't think that you're going to you know, not have that happen to you. Uh, in any case, uh, I'm doing something I normally don't do. I'm trying to clear the edge of my property. Normally, I don't concern myself too much with boundaries because most of the properties bordering my property belong to people who have never been into the areas where I'm trimming and probably never will. But I did want to get a really good idea of where my property lines were because I may do a, a couple of building projects out here. So this year, I've actually marked the edge of my property. The survey markers, and this is pretty much universal, the survey markers are just rebar that's been pounded into the ground, and there's barely any of it sticking out of the ground, usually less than an inch. So I've incorporated some PVC pipe into my current project just to get the ribbons up high enough that I can see them from a distance. 
So that's another thing that might be good to have if you're doing this kind of work is a little bit of PVC pipe. A pretty easy concept to grasp is a, a concept of not wanting anything dangerous in your forest and that would be anything that is sick, dead, or dying that is heavy enough or tall enough to uh, fall over and damage other trees or even damage you or whoever happens to be out there. Right after Hurricane Katrina, the Corps of Engineers came through and offered to remove any dangerous trees. And the uh, first thing I had to do was sign a contract with them. And in there, it said that they would be removing all hangers and leaners. So those are two words that apparently get used regularly by people who do tree work. A uh, hanger would be anything that is dead and off the ground, like a limb that's caught up in other limbs or a dead top or uh, just anything that's up off the ground that could potentially fall. A uh, leaner would just be any tree that is out of kilter from where it was prior to the storm. And we've got quite a few of those. I've actually got a pine tree that's about 100 feet tall and very big around that's right over my driveway. And as you can guess, I never park underneath the part uh, that is the direction that the tree is leaning. And, and I also tell others not to do that. But anyways, we... Some, you have to uh, be aware of what you're capable of. You don't want to be tackling a job that is bigger than you can handle. And, and I use that as uh, a decision maker all the time. I've got quite a few trees here that really need to come down, but they're beyond what I'm able to do, so we don't mess with them. But I'm going to go ahead and show you one that's uh, a hanger that I can reach and uh, I can cut with my battery-operated chainsaw now. All right, I'm going to show you, uh, we've got this hanger here that's been in these two trees for many years. It's doing damage to that tree, and it's doing damage to this tree, although it's, that's not that big of an issue. The tree is so sickly, I'll probably take it down. Well, we're going to take this hanger out, and I'm going to explain to you a few things to think about when you're using a chainsaw. You want this, this, this log weighs probably a thousand pounds and you really want it to come down in a predictable fashion and you don't want it to come down on you. In fact, one of the main reasons we're taking things like this down is so it doesn't come down on anybody. But if we go to the ends and start working, for, we're going to end up with a mess. Uh, we can't reach that end. Uh, that end's kind of hung up in a tree so close that you're really not going to be able to do too much. But looking at this, I, want, I don't want this log to fall like that. I want it to fall in the center because I don't think I can get it to fall like that. So, because there's not enough weight on that end, and even though there is enough weight on that end, what we don't want is this end to fall this way and this end to fall that way. You're going Because that would cause your saw to get locked up in a tree. Now, if we want this thing to fall like that, then we can't cut from the top because as it's falling, those two pieces will pinch on your saw. And if you've got another saw, you can come up from the bottom and cut it out. But in general, if you've only got one and it gets caught in something that weighs this much, you're not going to get your saw out. You have to go get car jacks and pulleys and all that. So we're, we're going to try to avoid that situation. Now, if you've noticed, I started cutting here it looked like a pretty good place to cut mostly because it was really skinny there and I knew my little battery operated saw would get through but after thinking about it I couldn't really determine which way the log would fall cutting it there but cutting it over a little further it's still somewhat skinny because uh, it's got this limb that comes off back here which which means that this trunk which is very big, splits into two smaller trunks, and we really don't have to worry about cutting this because it's hanging free in the air. So if we cut up in here, then the log should fall. Now, if you know, I've already started here, just like I started over here, but this is where we're going to finish off. And I'm going to come up from the bottom. Not only is this a battery operated chainsaw, it's a battery operated chainsaw with a battery that's nearing the end of its useful life. 
So it's amazing that I'm actually getting this done. But there you go. Now I got to recharge this battery in order to cut each piece in half and then see if there's any pieces I can pick up. If they're too heavy, I'll have to recharge the battery again and cut that up too. That job actually took me about three days. Now I'm not talking about three eight hour days. In fact, all total, it was probably only about two hours involved and that includes walking to my house to plug the battery back into the charger and uh, setting up the camera and everything. Now there's two saving graces to this job. Is uh, One, when the log hit the ground, the small end pretty much broke up on its own because it was really, really rotten. Another saving grace is that the saw doesn't take very long to recharge, only about an hour, probably less. So even though it took a lot of trips back and forth to get it done, I was able to get it done quite quickly. If you're wondering why I don't just go out and buy a new battery, well, the battery on a battery-operated chainsaw is about $100, at least for this one. Uh, the chain and bar do wear out. There's no getting around it. And so if I have to get a new bar and chain, that's about $30. So we're at $130 in repairs for a hundred and twenty dollar saw. So I'll just keep using this saw until it's completely shot and I'll probably get another battery operated saw with a little bit more power. In fact about twice as strong as this one for a hundred and sixty dollars. In my own personal version of a paradise there's not going to be anything dead. I, I believe that a paradise would be filled with living healthy things. But in some cases it's just impractical to take down things that are sick, either because it's a bigger job than you can handle or because it could potentially serve a useful purpose. Now this particular tree has been standing here dead uh, ever since I got the property 20 years ago and it's hard as rock because uh, it's hickory. I mean it's a very obviously a hickory tree because there's a big circle of hickory trees around here that are about 20 years old or younger and there is no other large nut producing hickories anywhere around here so that's probably the mama of all of them. Now the tree has some aesthetic beauty which is one reason to keep it but uh, it's already a hundred percent cured firewood so I could cut this down and stack it up but when you do that you have to find a place to stack it and uh, you have to protect it because once it's cut down you can't just lay it on the ground it'll eventually rot but standing there, it'll be ready to go any time for the next 20 years. This is another feature of the property that's been here since uh, the day that I purchased it. And I think it's a maple. This log has been laying here for a long time. And every now and then we'll get lighter knots off of it. Uh, one of the things that I suspect about this log, but I don't know for sure, is that this tree is part of it. In other words, it fell, one of the branches went into the ground, eventually developed its own root system, sprouted, and the tree is still here, even though the log is obviously long dead. And another thing about this log that's somewhat unique is that it supports uh, green moss that's very, very picky about its uh, environment. So I, I don't have a whole lot of places that will support this particular organism and so uh, I've never even come close to making a decision to cut this up and burn it. It's, it's a permanent fixture here. The log we just looked at is probably the most beautiful log that we've got laying on the ground on the, on the property but it's not the only one. We've actually got probably I don't know 500 logs laying down from the hurricane and and right after the hurricane I did come out and start cutting on these but after a few years it's uh, it gets more and more difficult to cut these without destroying your bar and chain because these logs get full of dirt from insect activity and basically uh, they just turn into dirt so you pretty much have to wait until they rot enough that you can break them into pieces and carry them off by hand. I uh, I really like that one we just looked at because it had the green moss on it, but every log supports some kind of life. Any one of these that you break open is going to be full of uh, beetles or uh, full of ants. They've got these ants that are huge, amber-colored ants that don't seem to live anywhere except in logs. So we always want to have some logs on the ground, but you know, it's just like anything else. You don't want your whole ground covered with logs. Occasionally, 
a tree will fall over and where it hits the ground it'll put out roots and sometimes the roots will come out of the ground and actually turn into branches and that's what's happened here this looks like a really good cherry tree and in fact it's probably healthier looking than most of the small cherry trees on my property but it's nothing more than a root that's been pulled out of the ground and grown leaves and there's proof this tree could live for decades i don't know but uh, i have hundreds of cherry trees on the property and so this one here probably needs to go in a natural forest what you actually want more than anything is a bunch of really really big trees and trees grow really really slow over the course of a single man's life they're not going to become old growth uh, forest trees so we just have to do the best we can now the only thing that you that can affect the growth of a tree is nutrients water temperature and light there's not much you can do about the temperature. Whatever the temperature is, is what it's going to be. Where I live, there's really nothing that I need to do about nutrients and water. Because, first off, even if we have a drought, there's no way for me to water all of this. So I'm pretty much dependent on natural rainwater to take care of that. I'm also pretty much dependent on natural fertilizer, which I have more than enough. No matter how many trees are in here, they're all going to get more than enough nutrients because i got about two inches of leaf litter here. When I say leaf litter, I mean fresh leaves, 100-year-old uh, leaves, uh, dead insects, uh, feces, all kinds of things like that. So basically, this piece of land can support as many trees as you can put on it. But light is a different thing. You can control light. So if you've got a really tight cluster of trees and some of them are not getting any light, you can thin that out. And that's our primary reason for thinning trees. When I first moved here, that is what my entire property looked like. A whole bunch of very small, uh, tightly bunched stands of trees. And so you really, that's obviously not a paradise of pleasure. So the first thing you're going to have to do is thin that out enough so that the trees are getting enough light. And uh, you're going to find that because of how tightly packed these are, that a lot of the trees get really, really tall, really, really skinny. That's called a being leggy, L-E-G-G-Y, like a human leg, because they're just so tall and skinny. They're trying to find some light so that they can stay alive. I've got one right here that is a good example of that. It's hung up in a tree right now. But after I cut it, that's where it went, because it cannot support its weight. Its weight was previously supported by the trees that surrounded it, so it's got to go. I'll cut that down. Eventually, I'll get in here and take out about 33% of these trees, just leave the biggest ones, then kind of walk around, get a feel for what is the healthiest stuff in there, and make sure to remove everything that isn't healthy. Another thing that I find rather typical about the Deep South is this kind of mess. This is uh, pretty much the way every tree out here, every large tree out here looked when I moved to the property. The only solution is to cut them all off at ground level and then start pulling them out. I usually try to pull all the small ones first because the big ones really don't want to come out. Sometimes when you're pulling the small ones, the tendrils are connected to tendrils on the big ones. It breaks them. It makes it easier to pull the big ones. So in, and in general, you're not even going to be able to pull the really big ones out until you pull the small ones out and cause a little bit of damage. Sometimes you'll have to just leave them hanging until they die you know cut the bottoms come back in about a month and I try again and if that doesn't work come back in a year i've got vines that i pull out of the trees now that i cut off maybe five years ago so just know that that's the case now you don't need to go get a book out and try to figure out what kind of vines you have if you live in the southeastern united states i'm going to tell you what i find here and it's basically what you're going to find wherever you are in the deep south You've got grapes, and by grapes I mean muscadines, scopinines, wild grapes, any kind of grapes. You've got uh, cross vine, which is the one that has the four leaves hanging, and then when you cut it, the uh, stem will have an X on it. There's also Virginia creeper. There's poison ivy, which, you know, when there's three, uh, stay away, or there's some kind of saying about that. But there's also uh, greenbrier. So that's it. Greenbrier, poison ivy, Virginia creeper, grapes, and cross vine. That's it. And uh, I like to keep some 
of each vine somewhere around here. The only problem is this is where you normally find it and you can't just go in and say, well, that's a pretty vine. I'm going to save that one because by the time you pull the others down, it's down too. There's no way to leave one vine in this pile. So what you have to do is pretty much cut them all down and then over time as you see new growth coming, just kind of protect it. Don't run over it with your weed eater or something like that. Now I'm going to say something that, uh, that a lot of people are confused about. I'm going to straighten out right now. In the Bible, there are a lot of verses that make it appear as if this kind of stuff was created in order to punish man for different offenses that have been done throughout time, including the offense of eating from the tree of life. Uh, Genesis 3.19, it says, By the sweat of your brow you'll have to get food, and you'll do that until the day that you return to the ground from which you were taken. Uh, chapter 2 and verse 5 of Genesis is... Uh, Prior to this time, there had been no vegetation of the field because God had not uh, caused it to rain and man, he had not yet made man to till the ground. And uh, another one in chapter 4 and verse 12, talking to Cain, said, when you till the ground, it will not give you its produce or not yield its strength. When God created man, he was done. There is nothing that was created after man. He did not create vines and stickers and vegetation of the field after he created man. All of those things were in place, but they were where they belonged in the ecosystem beneath the canopy of the trees in a balanced world. So basically what God is telling him is, I'm really good at designing ecosystems. If you decide to get in there and alter it, in order to make it better, it won't. So it's not that God created vegetation of the field. He had already created vegetation. It's just that it had to have man come along and cut down trees and make a field. You know, it's not that stickers and vines took over in order to cause man problems. It, it's that stickers and vines took over because man was causing a problem. So we get all this down. We get a canopy up. This is not going to be a problem anymore. These particular vines and stickers and things will be in their place and they'll be the size they're supposed to be. They'll be pretty to look at and they won't cause us harm. This is cross vine. It's not very offensive. In other words, it doesn't grow so quick that it can do injury. And in fact, it grows straight up a tree. It doesn't wrap around a tree like a grapevine. Grapevine will wrap around a tree and do some serious damage. Here's a couple of trees that I pulled grapevine off of, and you can see that over time, as the tree grows, it strangles itself. Now, I would normally cut this kind of stuff down, but just to have a couple of examples for people to see, I have left a few up. Um, this is grapevines, and this one is really, really huge, but it's okay because it's growing in the top of a really huge tree. It's not gonna cause any problems. Now, poison ivy is another vine that really doesn't cause any problems, and it feeds the birds. And unless you climb trees, then there's really no reason to take it down. However, a word of warning, no matter what kind of vine you take out of a tree, you need to wear two layers of clothing with long sleeves and gloves and long pants, because even if you're pulling a grapevine down, it may be bruising a poison ivy vine on its way down. And if that happens, you're going to get poison ivy poisoning even though you're not pulling poison ivy down. You may not think that this isn't going to happen to you, but poison ivy vines will grow all the way into the top of the tree, and as they're young, they'll be covered with leaves all the way up. But as they get older, they'll just uh, they'll drop all the leaves on the trunk of the tree so that you really can't identify it. Uh, in fact, poison ivy looks very much like Virginia creeper, although the number of leaves is different. Virginia creeper uh, dies back in the winter, so you really don't ever have to do anything with that. Now, greenbrier, here's, a, here's what greenbrier looks like uh, near the bottom. All of those stickers only grow up to about as far as you can reach. Now, I have a theory that that's the way they were designed to keep people from pulling them down. Once you get that initial 9 or 10 feet pulled down you'll get to something that's smooth like this. And here's what the leaves look like, although there are many, many varieties of uh, green briar, so you really, uh, you'll, you'll have to get used to what the vine looks like because the leaves are always a little bit different. 
I said earlier that in a deep south, you're only going to run into five different vines. What I should have said is that you're only going to run into about five different vines if you're out under the canopy of the woods or the forest, because for whatever reason, uh, and it may be uh, the uh, lack of light or it may be the soil conditions underneath an oak forest, I really haven't run into hardly any honeysuckle or legumes or, or even morning glories, which are also known as strangleweed. So morning glories are a big problem for some people, and they will choke out a lot of stuff, but I typically, I don't see it. I don't see it out here in the woods. Right now, we're standing in an area that I just recently cleared. Now, right here are three wild blueberry bushes that I was trying to save. They were so filled with vines. By the time I got done pulling the vines out, they were all broken up. And so I ended up having to prune them back to where they weren't just fractured uh, limbs, but nice, smooth cuts to keep as much of the disease down as possible. But that's what you end up dealing with when, you, when you've got a lot of vines in, in your stuff you're not going to be able to get the vines out without damaging the stuff you're trying to save. Now, if you've noticed, these uh, three blueberry bushes have tags on them. They're three completely different varieties. I just felt like if these wild ones happen to survive, they can help to pollinate three cultivated blueberries. So I planted them there. Now I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the health of the forest. And when I talk about the health of the forest, primarily what I'm talking about is health of individual trees within the forest. Because even though it's very easy to tell if a tree is just dead, it's sometimes very difficult to tell if a tree is dying. A tree that is fatally injured can live for decades before it finally succumbs to any injuries it may incur. Now this particular tree is one of the sickest trees in, the, in my woods that I continue to allow to live. And the reason for that is a major part of forest health is diversity, and this is the only member of this species that lives in my forest. This is a tupelo tree. It's not just the only tupelo tree that I own, it's the only tupelo tree I've ever seen. This tree would normally get cut down if it was a regular species like the ones that surround us. Now, there is green growth here. When I cut this back to here, I was able to determine that the tree was alive to here by scraping it with my thumbnail. Once you scrape through the outer bark, you get to what's called a cambium, and if it's green, the tree is alive. If it's brown, it isn't. But just because it's green doesn't mean it's, it's healthy. So we're going to let it go a few more years, and we'll cut it back some more, cut it back some more. Probably, or at least possibly, the greatest potential this tree has is in the roots. The roots seem to still be alive because all this growth down here is the same as this. It's tupelo. So we may end up with a really odd-shaped tupelo tree, but I got a feeling that even if I have to cut this entire uh, trunk off, that we'll still have a tupelo tree. Now I'm going to give you a little bit better idea of what you're looking at when you're trying to determine if a young tree is alive or dead. We're just going to use our fingernail to scrape off the outer bark. Now this won't work with an old growth pine tree or oak tree, but for a younger tree, it's sufficient. I know that it's difficult, if even possible, to see that that's green under there, but when we compare it to what it looks like, when you do the same thing to a dead tree, the difference is profound. If you scrape off the outer bark of a tree and it looks like this, your tree is dead. A major issue in regard to tree health where I live is trees that are leaning. I live in a hurricane zone. Every time a hurricane comes through, some trees end up leaning over. If it's a small hurricane doing very little damage, you can usually go out and tie up a lot of the leaning trees using other trees. However, in a major hurricane, you'll have so many trees leaning that there's no way to fix it. And in fact, some of the trees are so large, you couldn't fix them if they were the only leaning tree that you had. Another problem we have due to hurricanes is scarring because some trees don't just lean, they fall. And when they fall, they usually wound other trees on their way down. Initially, this may not seem like a big deal, but over the course of time, the wounds that end up on these trees end up being scars, serious scars, which leads to rot, which leads to the trees becoming hollow, which eventually leads to the trees themselves falling down. This is a very major problem. Where I live, I have to burn a lot of debris. 
Anytime you burn debris in the forest, you're going to cause some kind of problems. It's always best to try to stay as far away from living trees with your fire pile as you possibly can. But even then, the heat can have a cumulative effect. A lot of the trees around my burn piles look good for months after I burn a pile of debris. But over the course of time, they develop scarring not unlike the scarring caused by falling trees in a hurricane. Any tree that is scarred can be considered a tree that will eventually become hollow and diseased, and any tree that becomes hollowed and diseased can be considered a dead tree. A lot of times you end up with trees that are bent, and they're not really bent trees. They're simply trees that leaned over so far that the tops died, and all that lived were limbs coming out of the side. A lot of the trees end up looking like they... They just started heading off in one direction and eventually righted themselves. These are trees that have uh, been bent and died and had other growth come out. Here's a cherry tree that has done that. You can still see the top of the tree is dead even though it looks like a limb, whereas a limb is alive and looks like the trunk. This tree has no future whatsoever and will be cut down. Tree injury can also be caused by lawn equipment. This wound was made by me several years ago using what was basically a very large nylon string trimmer mower. The injury didn't seem that bad at the time, but as the tree has grown, it has not recovered. This tree will probably have to come down. Another kind of damage that can happen in a storm is the death of the top of the tree. You can't really tell when a storm is initially over because all of the foliage will be gone. But as time goes on and the tree recovers, you'll notice that even though the bottom of the tree may recover quite well, the top of the tree never does because this is where most of the swaying takes place in the parts of the tree that are unable to handle it. Another problem that you may uh, see in your forest is caused by lightning strikes. Another problem that you're going to run into if you're trying to take care of a forest is lightning strikes. When lightning strikes a tree, in general, it will leave a strip of bark missing about an inch or two wide, all the way from the top of the tree to the bottom of the tree. And once again, this is a wound. The wound is going to cause disease and rot, and eventually it's going to cause the death of the tree. Hopefully, as is often the case, uh, the limbs will all fall off first and then the top will fall out so that when the tree itself falls over, it doesn't do too much damage to the surrounding trees. A rather odd thing that can take place in a forest is a natural form of grafting. In this particular example, this tree has twisted and so the limbs have grafted into one another. This tree will have to come down. This, this kind of injury will eventually rot and cause the tree to die. In this example, the tree actually grafted to another tree. I may be able to eventually remove this piece of grafted wood, but at the same time, there's enough growth around here that I can probably just cut this down and something else will take its place. Another kind of damage that we've already seen is vine damage. When a tree is very young, vines can cause this kind of damage. When a tree is much older, too many vines can still kill limbs, as in this example. In a natural forest, what you actually want more than anything is a bunch of really really big trees. And trees grow really, really slow. Over the course of a single man's life, they're not going to become old growth uh, forest trees. So we just have to do the best we can. Now the only thing that you that can affect the growth of a tree is nutrients, water, temperature, and light. There's not much you can do about the temperature. Whatever the temperature is, is what it's going to be. Where I live, there's really nothing that I need to do about nutrients and water because, first off, even if we have a drought, there's no way for me to water all of this. So I'm pretty much dependent on natural rainwater to take care of that. I'm also pretty much dependent on natural fertilizer, which I have more than enough. No matter how many trees are in here, they're all going to get more than enough nutrients because I got about two inches of leaf litter here. When I say leaf litter, I mean fresh leaves, 100-year-old uh, leaves, uh, dead insects, uh, feces, all kinds of things like that 
So basically this piece of land can support as many trees as you can put on it, but light is a different thing. You can control light. So if you've got a really tight cluster of trees and some of them are not getting any light, you can thin that out. And that's our primary reason for thinning trees. Now, if you take a tangled mess of woods like I started with and you get it cleared out to where you can walk around in it just like I can, then you're going to attract a lot of different species of animal. That's land animals and birds. And if you have a water feature somewhere on the property, fish as well. The forest in general will provide for their needs, especially if you keep in mind that you want to get as much diversity as possible while you're in the thinning process. Now, if our actual goal is to create a paradise, then there's something else we're going to have to add, and that's human food. Unless you want to subsist on hunting, trapping, and fishing, you're going to have to plant some trees that will provide human food. In general, no forest anywhere is going to do that. You'll get your little bits and pieces of uh, forage food every now and then, but that will not sustain you. I recently cleared out this area, and I cleared it out a lot more than I don't normally do because we're underneath some massive oaks, which are providing a canopy for this entire area. Canopy trees don't need to grow under canopy trees. However, fruit trees in general are not canopy trees. They're understory trees. I've got probably around a thousand species or a thousand individual trees and shrubs that pr produce human food here. Right here is a pe uh, peach tree. Just behind that is a quince and directly behind that are the three blueberry bushes I showed you earlier. Over to my left is a lime tree and a lemon tree and another blueberry. From here, I can easily identify uh, an orange tree there, a loquat, and directly behind that, another orange tree, and right here, another orange tree. Now, they're not the, all the same oranges. There's navel oranges, Valencia oranges, blood oranges, every kind of orange that will grow in this area I have purchased and got planted here. Uh, there are two pomegranate trees and another loquat or Japanese plum. There is a pear tree, and if we walk through this forest, I could point at food producing trees and shrubs all day long. If you're gonna have variety, it's gotta be variety that will feed everything. And in fact, most of my fruit trees have never given me any fruit simply because the animals like human food trees as much as they like animal food trees. When we gradually thin our trees over the years, as opposed to thinning them all out at once, we're leaving ourselves a little bit of a backup plan because even if half the trees in our forest die, we'll still have the other half to fill in the gaps. And the same can be true of these large canopy trees. As you can tell, this tree in front of us is extremely sick and may fall over at any time. But if it does, we've got a younger canopy tree beneath it. No canopy tree needs canopy trees underneath it, but if you, you know your trees are sick, then it's just a wise thing to have something waiting in the ready to fill in that space. This tree probably covers about 5,000 square feet of ground. If it goes down, that's a lot of weeds that are going to come up that you have to deal with. But if it comes down, that smaller tree will grow quickly to fill in the gaps. And if you notice, I've got a few all the way down this line. Just to prove my point, that tree laying down over there was part of that small cluster of trees just three weeks ago. It was leaning ever since Hurricane Katrina and about three weeks ago it just fell right over. Underneath the tree where the roots were connected to the ground was a lot of rot caused by the leaning of the tree. We've talked quite a bit about which uh, trees to save, how to determine if a tree is sick or healthy, how to cut down a tree. We haven't talked much about understory shrubbery, and for the most part, you, we really don't have to because uh, obviously in my forest, I try to keep as many different kinds of shrubbery as I do trees, and I try to keep the healthiest species. But a lot of times, the easiest way to deal with understory shrubbery is simply to cut it all down. If you cut it, all your trees down, uh, it takes years and years and years for them to come back, and when they come back, if they come back from the root of a cut-down tree, they look more like a bush than like a tree. Well, with shrubbery, under, understory shrubbery, that's not much of an issue because it is a bush. So when it comes back looking like a bush, it's basically just what it was, and it's going to be healthy when it comes back. This American Beautyberry, um, although it's hard to identify, 
in the winter, uh, I know it's an American Beauty Berry because I actually cut around it intentionally because it was easy to do so. But all of this stuff behind me could just be run over. A lot of it is little uh, oak seedlings, which you really don't want underneath these oak trees. But we've also got Yopon Holly and American Beauty Berries. We've got Chinese Privet. And then there's a little bit of pawpaws in there. Now with pawpaws, I really love my pawpaws, so I'm going to do everything in my power not to cut any of those down. But everything else, uh, as big as it is, in a year or two, will be just that big again. In your attempts to rescue the forest, you are going to have to kill things, whether intentionally or inadvertently. Obviously, you'll be killing trees that you cut down, but also you'll be killing things that live on those trees. This is a tree that obviously has to come down. It's very, very sick. It's going to eventually fall. On this tree is some Spanish moss. Now, I brought this Spanish moss here from another location, and I brought a huge amount of it, an entire garbage can full, and almost every bit of it died. So if you come across a tree that has Spanish moss growing on it, like this tree, then you're going to want to remove that Spanish moss and take it somewhere where it can continue living. However, you don't want to simply grab it and bring it to another tree. Instead, a much better way to do it is to cut the limb off that the Spanish moss is growing on and carry it by that limb and hang it in another tree of the exact same species that you removed it from. Another thing that you might find growing on a dead limb that has to be removed is resurrection fern. Now, if the, the limb is not endangering anybody, I'll leave it there with the fern on it, but occasionally that can't be done. You'll have to cut it up. When you do that, try to remove the limb as carefully as possible, and then try to separate the part of the limb with the fern on it and set it somewhere else. This one is going to my mother's house because I think she'll like it. It is my hope that you have thoroughly enjoyed this video presentation of how I care for my little part of the earth. It's possible that you discovered that the ecosystem where you live is nothing at all like the ecosystem where I live. But that's okay because the basic principles still apply no matter where you live. This video is not all that there is. This is a second part in a two-part video series, the first video being entitled Caring for the Earth, a Bible Perspective. I highly recommend that you go back and watch that if you didn't watch it prior to coming to this video. If you consider yourself a Christian, you may find that your beliefs on this particular subject do not match the ideals as found in God's Word, the Bible. You may get a very strong urge to attempt to adjust your current religious belief system to be more in line with what you have learned in this video. A better solution would be to simply walk away from that and give your attention to doing God's will as found in His Word, the Bible. If you don't want to survive, don't listen to me.